Hi, and welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University and here with the Center for Atlantic Studies, the Cosmos Society, and special guests, Adam Barnard and Matt Carbone. Uh, we've got some special actors with us to help out today. Um, they're Evie Miller, Eunice Roberts, Michael Lumsden, Paulo Mahoney, Tom DeLapp, Tamika Chavez, and Richard O'Neill, uh, uh, Richard Neal, I gave him an O there, to join, uh, to join um, special guests, Adam Bernard and Matt Carbone. Iphigenia at Aulis is one of Euripides' last plays. It was written like the Bacchae when Euripides was living abroad in the court of a Macedonian king. It's typically, typically considered his last play. It tells the story of the sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter to appease the gods for some wrong so that the Greeks can leave harbor for, um, from Aulis to go to Troy. This is the story studiously untold in Homer's Iliad, but central to the anger of Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, and Aeschylus's play named after him. The sacrifice of this girl comes at the end of generations of dysfunction in the house of Atreus. But this play is not exactly what one might expect. It was composed, again like the Bacchae, after a generation of war in Athens, and the question it asks, uh, it seems to me to look more outward to the audience than backward to myth. The play is about the cost of war. It's about the decisions leaders make. Euripides asks us to consider what it's like to be Agamemnon. What pressures eventuate in the sacrifice of a child? This play questions who is in charge in a crisis? And it ends with a dim view of the Achaean army, which is compared to a mob screaming for the sacrifice of Iphigenia and threatening to stone Achilles if he gets in the way. Irrational mobs, agitation to sacrifice one to preserve freedom of action for the many. It doesn't sound familiar at all today. But the play starts with Agamemnon waffling. He meets with a slave. He tries to repeal his decision. Um, complaining about the entrapment of fame, the limits of human choice. And then he tells the story of the run up to the war, focusing on the sisters, Clytemnestra and, and Helen, his wife, and the whole reason for the war. And the opening scenes culminate in Agamemnon blaming it on Menelaus, setting the plan of having Iphigenia come as a bride to Achilles. He sends his wife a letter to call it off. The chorus sings the catalog of heroes. It increases the magnitude of decision. And then we learn the letter didn't make it. Menelaus, Agamemnon's brother has it. And that's the first scene we'll start with today. What is this uproar at the gates, this indecent brawling? My tale, not his, has the better right to be spoken. You, Menelaus. What quarrel do you have with this man? Why are you dragging him here? Look me in the face. May that be the prelude to my story. Shall I, the son of Atreus, close my eyes from fear? Do you see this tablet? The bearer of a shameful message. I see it, yes. Now you, first of all, surrender it. No, not till I have shown its contents to all the army. What? Have you broken the seal and know already what you should never have known? Yes, I opened it and know to your sorrow the secret machinations of your heart. Where did you get it? Oh, gods, what a shameless heart you have. I was awaiting your daughter's arrival at the camp in Argos. What right have you to watch my doings? Is not this a proof of shamelessness? My wish to do it gave the spur, for I am no slave to you. Infamous. Am I not allowed to be the management of my own house? No, for you think crooked thoughts, one thing now, another formally, and something different presently. Most exquisite refining on evil themes. A hateful thing, the tongue of cleverness. Yes, but a mind unstable is an unjust possession, disloyal to friends. What we've just heard is a very lively direct exchange between the two angry brothers. And what we'd next get in the play is something very different, a passage which in fact has been suspected by, by the textual critics, where Menelaus sets out his case against Agamemnon. Uh, aside from the stylistic criteria, it's certainly true that the speech represents a marked change of pace from what we Menelaus 
repeatedly removes the threat to fully expose Agamemnon to the army. Instead, he tries to get him to curb his anger, to admit to, admit to what he has done, basically. In addition to summarizing most of the background of the play, he employs a sort of rhetorical argument, almost as if he were in a law, in a law court. And the gist of this is that, uh, the first argument, is that Agamemnon secured his position as a leader of the Greeks by being friendly, keeping his door open. Now his character has changed and he's turning against his allies. And secondly, when confronted with the lack of winds, his command, Agamemnon is simply despaired and sought Menelaus' advice. And this seems to have led to the consultation of the priests called Calchas, who uttered the prophecy about sacrificing Iphigenia to Artemis. As Menelaus argues, Agamemnon, Agamemnon willingly accepted this plan. And now his change of heart shows him to have a fickle character, especially when confronted with a possibility of failure. Menelaus's speech ends with a lament that Greece should not be led by, uh, by brave. These are men who can defeat the so-called barbarians. Agamemnon, apparently unconvinced, then replies at some length that he is a good leader, uh, and he turns the character accusation back at Menelaus. Here, Agamemnon almost seems prepared to relinquish his oath and his command in order to save his child. At least that's what the character portrayal that we find in the text. But it's about to be precipitated and transformed by the course of events in the play. A messenger now arrives to announce that Agamemnon's daughter, Iphigenia, has um, made it to Aulis, and surprise, surprise, with the rest his wife, Clastra, and the baby boy, Ovis. Even worse, this arrival has been witnessed by most of the army. And the idea that Iphigenia is to be married, Agamemnon's original ruse, is the rumor now circulating in the army. Agamemnon, Lord of Hellas, I have come and bring you your daughter, whom you call Iphigenia, in your home, and her mother, your wife Clytemnestra, is with her, and the child Orestes, a sight to gladden you after your long absence from your home, but they've been traveling long and hard. They're now resting their tender feet at the waters of a fair spring, they and their horses, for we turned these loose in the grassy meadows to browse their fill, but I have come as their forerunner to prepare you for their reception. For the army knows already of your daughter's arrival. So quickly did the rumor spread, and all the people are running together to the site that they may see your child, for fortune's favorites enjoy worldwide fame and have all eyes fixed on them. Some say, is it a wedding? Or what is happening? Or has King Agamemnon from fond yearnings summoned his daughter here? From others you would have heard, they are presenting the maiden to Artemis, queen of Aulis, previous to marriage. Who can the bridegroom be? That is to lead her home. So come then, begin the rites that is the next step. By getting the baskets ready, crown your heads. You too, Lord Menelaus, prepare the wedding hymn. Let flutes sound throughout the tents with noise of dancers' feet, for this is a happy day that has come for the maid. You have my thanks. Now go within. For the rest, it will be well as fate proceeds. Ah, oh, woe is me, unhappy wretch. What can I say? Where shall I begin? To what cruel straits have I been plunged? A god has outwitted me, proving far cleverer than any cunning of mine. What an advantage humble birth possesses, for it is easy for her sons to weep and tell out all their sorrows, while to the high-born man come these same sorrows, but we have dignity throned over our life and other people's slaves. I, for instance, am ashamed to weep and no less ashamed, poor wretch, to check my tears at the dreadful past to which I am brought. Enough. What am I to tell my wife? How shall I welcome her? With what face meet her? For she too has undone me by coming uninvited in this my hour of sorrow. Yet it was only natural she should come with her daughter to prepare the bride and perform the fondest duties where she will discover my villainy. And for this poor maid, why maid, death it seems will soon make her his bride. How I pity her. 
Thus she will plead to me, I think, my father, will you slay me? May you yourself make such a marriage and whoever is a friend to you. While Orestes from his station near us will cry in childish accents, inarticulate yet fraught with meaning. Alas, to what utter ruin Paris, the son of Priam, the cause of these troubles has brought me by his union with Helen. I pity her myself as a woman who is a stranger may grieve for the misfortunes of royalty. Your hand, brother, let me grasp it. I give it. Yours is the victory, mine the sorrow. By Pelops, our reputed grandsire, and Atreus, our father, I swear to tell you the truth from my heart without any covert purpose, but only what I think. The sight of you in tears made me pity you. And in return, I shed a tear for you myself. I withdraw from my former proposals, ceasing to be a cause of fear to you. Yes, and I will put myself in your present position. And I counsel you do not slay your child or prefer my interests to, to yours. For it is not just that you should grieve while I am glad or that your children should die while mine still see the light of day. What is it after all I seek? If I'm set on marriage, could I not find a bride as choice elsewhere? Was I to lose a brother? The last I should have lost to win a Helen, getting bad for good. I was mad, impetuous as a youth till I perceived on closer view what slaying children really meant. Moreover, I am filled with compassion for the hapless maiden, doomed to bleed that I may wed when I reflect that we are kin. What has your daughter to do with Helen? Let the army be disbanded and leave Aulis. Dry those streaming eyes, brother, and do not provoke me to tears. Whatever concern you have in oracles that affect your child, let it be none of mine. Into your hands I resign my share. A sudden change, you'll say, from my dread proposals. A natural cause for me. Affection for my brother caused the change. These are the ways of a man not devoid of virtue to pursue on each occasion what is best. A generous speech worthy of Tantalus, the son of Zeus. You do not shame your ancestry. I thank you, Menelaus, for this unexpected suggestion. It is an honourable proposal worthy of you. Sometimes love, sometimes the selfishness of their families cause a quarrel between brothers. I loathe the relationship of this kind, which is bitterness to both. But it is useless. For circumstances compel me to carry out the murderous sacrifice of my daughter. How so? Who will compel you to slay your own? The whole Achaean army here assembled. Not if you send her back to Argos. I might do that unnoticed, but there will be another thing I cannot. What is that? You must not fear the mob too much. Calchas will tell the Argive army his oracles. Not if he should die before that. An easy matter. The whole tribe of seers is a curse with its ambition. Yes, and good for nothing and useless when among us. Has the thought which is rising in my mind no terrors for you? How can I understand your meaning unless you declare it? The son of Sisyphus knows all. Odysseus cannot possibly hurt us. He was ever shifty by nature, siding with the mob. True. He is enslaved by the love of popularity, a fearful evil. Don't you think then he will arise among the Argives and tell them the oracles that Calchas delivered, saying of me that I undertook to offer Artemis a victim and after all improving false? Then when he has carried the army away with him, he will bid the Argives slay us and sacrifice the girl. And if I escape to Argos, they will come and destroy the place, raising it to the ground, Cyclopean walls and all. That is my trouble. Woe is me. To what perplexities the gods have brought me at this pass. Take one precaution for me, Menelaus, as you go through the army. That Clytemnestra does not learn this till I have taken my child and devoted her to death, that my affliction may be attended with the fewest tears. And you foreign women, keep silence.
So we just witnessed a scene that took me in so many different directions that I'm not sure what to make of it. And it's, it's pretty amazing because the scene starts out with Menelaus saying we have to sacrifice the girl and then don't sacrifice the girl. And oh wait, the army says we have to sacrifice a girl. So Agamemnon has come full circle. I think it, it's bewildering for me to even imagine this on an ancient stage. Um, so let's think about this sort of in a modern context. How do we even make this believable if we can? So Adam Barnard is here with us today and he is a director. Um, Adam, what do you think about this? How, how would you make this work? Uh, how to make it believable? Um, well, that it's to me, I mean, I would just echo, it is one of the most extraordinary about turns. That line, that circumstances compel me to carry out the sacrifice of my daughter. I mean, for, for any father to utter that, it's such a shock, it's such a gasp moment. Um, how to how to carry it out? I mean, in many ways, I feel that the the, the writing the writing tells us all we need to know. The the shock is in the suddenness. The shock is in the fact that we've gone one way and we've gone and we've gone, and in one incredibly efficient line, the whole thing is turned upside down. Um, as for what's been going on in Agamemnon's mind during that. Uh, and what one chooses to do, that is wide open. And I think every production will have a different answer. Um, I, it might be interesting to, to, to ask Michael what his first instincts are about, about playing it. Um, you know, one, one could have absolutely nothing going on and it could be a total shock, or one could use the space around the chorus to show something of Agamemnon's uh, torture or thought processes. Mm. Um, Michael, having just read it, what's your what's your kind of feeling about it? Mm. I mean, it is bizarre. But it, in fact, when I first read it, I, I was I had to sort of go back and look at the end of that passage again to 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 just double check I hadn't misunderstood it, and it it it, it really was that bigger an about turn. Um, I, I I think what what the the actual little debate with, with Menelaus is for me the, the key to it. The, it, it you, you get these in, almost internal uh, speeches where, the, where, he, where he, when he goes into longer speeches, it's almost like a Shakespeare soliloquy. There, there, there seems to me a lot of the, the, what goes on there is, is actually him thinking things through. But it, it seems to me often the things that spark the changes and which spark the, the, those series of thoughts come out of those little snappy bits of dialogue, which seem very modern. Mm. Um, the argument between the two brothers it, it, it suddenly seems, um, you know, obviously uh, language aside, um, quite a contemporary thing. I think so. That... I think that's what I would probably look to in 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 the early stages in a rehearsal setting to to guide where it goes. You, I mean, you want to you want to latch on to these family relations because they're timeless, and the rivalry between brothers, and I think the absolute shock of what happens when your personal and professional lives come into total irreconcilable conflict is actually something that is very universal, even if the specific circumstances of sacrifice is bewildering. Um, I think that fundamental idea of an irre irreconcilable conflict in your life is. It is universal. I like the fact that both of you brought up that emotion, that shock. And I think part of what makes Euripides an interesting and challenging um, mm -hmm. artist is his willingness <laughs> to attempt to recreate that shock. Because one of the things modern audiences don't have in their repertoire when they watch these plays is years and years of experience knowing the ending, right? If you know at the beginning of the story that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father, the end of the movie doesn't surprise you that much, right? It's a different type of unfolding of events. So here to sort of rebreathe surprise into the experience by getting us to identify with Agamemnon is really the only strategy I can think of to take this from some burlesque satire into something that really makes you identify, which is part of what our Aristotle wants us to do with tragedy. So in this scene, uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon see the people as forcing them to do it. Right? And so this is a big move from the individual to the collective that enjoins the audience. Um, and it gives us a different model of human behavior and even a different model of history. And I think it's important to think about that as us being part of the current of events 
rather than driving it? And how do we reconcile this? And I think what's important is the work that the chorus does. Adam, you mentioned the space that it brings for reflection and sort of changing from scene to scene. The chorus comes out and sings a song about moderation and lust, right? And about women and Aphrodite and about the troubles before Iphigenia, decentering what's going on. Um, and then it mentions again, um, the, the whole family backstory as Clytemnestra and baby Orestes enter with Agamemnon. The chorus refocuses on the larger story in question and takes us back to the war and Helen's impact, tracing it back to Zeus's fathering of her. as sort of an exploration of cause and effect. And then we get to the next scene where we can continue this sort of investigation of the characters because we have the chorus, we have Clytemnestra, and we have Iphigenia on stage to speak for herself with Agamemnon, her father. Let us stand here, maidens of Chalcis, and lift the queen from her chariot to the ground without stumbling, supporting her gently with our arms, with kind intent that the renowned daughter of Agamemnon, just arrived, may feel no fear. Strangers ourselves, let us avoid anything that may disturb or frighten the strangers from Argos. I take this as a lucky omen your kindness and auspicious greeting, and have good hope that it is to a happy marriage I conduct the bride. Take from the chariot the dowry I am bringing for my daughter and convey it within with careful heed. My daughter, leave the horse-drawn chariot, planting your faltering footstep delicately. Young women, take her in your arms and lift her from the chariot and let one of you give me the support of her hand that I may quit my seat in the carriage with fitting grace. Some of you stand at the horse's heads, for the horse has a timid eye, easily frightened. Here, take this child Orestes, son of Agamemnon, baby as he is still. What, sleeping little one, tired out by your ride in the chariot, awake, to bless your sister's wedding, for you, my gallant boy, shall get by this marriage a kinsman gallant as yourself, the Nereid's godlike offspring. Come here to your mother, my daughter Iphigenia, and seat yourself beside me, and stationed near show my happiness to these strangers. Yes, come here, and welcome the father you love so dearly. Do not be angry with me, mother, if I run from your side and throw myself on my father's breast. Hail, my honoured lord, King Agamemnon. We have obeyed your commands and have come. Oh, my father, I long to outrun others and embrace you after this long while, for I yearn to see your face. Do not be angry with me. You may do so, daughter. For of all the children I have borne, you have always loved your father best. I see you, father, joyfully, after a long time. And I, your father, see you. Your words do equal duty for both of us. All hail, father. You did well in bringing me here to you. I know not how I am to say yes or no to that, my child. Ah, how wildly you are looking, in spite of your joy at seeing me. A man has many cares when he is king and general too. Be mine, all mine today. Do not turn to moody thoughts. Why, so I am, all yours today. I have no other thought. Then smooth your knitted brow, unbend and smile. See, my child, my joy at seeing you is even as it is. And do you then have tears streaming from your eyes? Yes. For long is the absence from each other that awaits us. I do not know, dear father. I do not know of what you are speaking. You are moving my pity all the more by speaking so sensibly. My words shall turn to senselessness, if that will cheer you more. Alas, this silence is too much. You have my thanks. Stay with your children at home, father. My own wish, but to my sorrow I may not. Ruin sees their wars and the woes of Menelaus. First will that which has been my lifelong ruin bring ruin to others. 
how long you were absent in the bays of Aulis. Yes, and there is still a hindrance to my sending the army forward. Where do men say the Phrygians live, father? In a land where I wish Paris, the son of Priam, never had dwelt. It is a long voyage you are bound on, father, after you leave me. You will meet your father again, my daughter. Ah, oh, would it were seemly for you to take me as a fellow voyager? You too have a voyage to make, to a haven where you will remember your father. Shall I sail there with my mother or alone? All alone, without father or mother. What? Have you found me a new home, father? Enough of this. It is not for girls to know such things. Please hurry home from Troy, father, as soon as you've triumphed there. There is a sacrifice I have first to offer here. Yes, it is your duty to heed religion with aid of holy rites. You will witness it, for you will be standing near the libations. Am I to lead the dance then, round the altar, father? I count you happier than myself because you know nothing. Go within, it is wrong for maidens to be seen. After you've given me your hand and a kiss, on the eve of your lengthy sojourn far from your father's side. Breast, cheek, and golden hair. Ah, how grievous you have found Helen and the Phrygian city. I can speak no more. The tears come welling to my eyes the moment I touch you. Go into the house. I beg your pardon, daughter of Leda. If I showed excessive grief, grief, if I showed excessive grief at the thought of giving my daughter to Achilles, for though we are sending her to taste of bliss, still it wrings a parent's heart when he, the father who has toiled so hard for them, commits his children to the home of strangers. I am not so senseless, but I think I will go through this as well when I lead the girl from the chamber to the sound of the marriage hymn. So I do not chide you, but custom will combine with time to make the smart grow less. As for him to whom you have betrothed our daughter, I know his name, it is true, but want to learn his lineage and the land of his birth. Happiness, attend the pair. Which day will he marry her? As soon as the full moon comes to give its blessing. Have you already offered the goddess a sacrifice to usher in the maiden's marriage? I am about to do so. That is the very thing I was engaged in. And then you will celebrate the marriage feast afterwards? Yes, when I have offered a sacrifice required by the gods of me. But where am I to make ready the feast for the women? Here, besides our gallant Argive ships. Finally here. But still I must. Good come of it for all that. Do you know what to do, lady? Then obey me. In what matter? For I was ever accustomed to obey you. Here, where the bridegroom is, I will... Which of my duties will you perform in the mother's absence? Give your child away with the help of Danaids. And where am I to be then? Go to Argos and take care of your unwedded daughters. And leave my child. Then who will raise her bridal torch? I will provide the proper wedding torch. That is not the custom. But you think lightly of these things. It is not good for you to be alone among a soldier crowd. It is good that a mother should give her own child away. Yes, and that those maidens at home should not be left alone. They are well guarded in their maiden bowers. Obey. No, by the goddess queen of Argos. Go manage matters out of doors, but in the house it is my place to decide what is proper for maidens at their wedding. Woe is me. My efforts are baffled. I am disappointed in my hope, anxious as I was to get my wife out of sight. Foiled at every point, I form my plots and subtle schemes against my... But I will go in spite of all with Calchas the priest to inquire the goddess's good pleasure, fraught with ill luck as it is to me and with trouble to Hellas. He who is wise should keep in his house a good and useful wife, or none at all. Well, we've just seen two very different sort of dialogues. Uh, one very, very pitiful between the father and his daughter, and one 
which starts out in a similar way, but descends into a kind of marital argument between a husband and wife. Um, Agamemnon in both cases is attempting to deceive uh, his interlocutor in a way. He's deceiving both his, water, his daughter and his wife, and he keeps making references to a sacrifice in connection with the proposed marriage, uh, which in both Clytemnestra accept this was the normal thing to do. One had to make a sacrifice or a small offering to Artemis or to Aphrodite or other goddesses before marriage. Um, but for Agamemnon, of course, all these statements have a much more uh, knowing and more ominous, uh, a more pitiful and darker meaning. Uh, he even tries to get completely rid of Clytemnestra at the end of this argument, as we've seen, ordering her back to their home in Argos, rather than to take her expected place in the marriage ceremony. And very headstrong against her husband, Clytemnestra has refused and this probably will have resonated in the audience as a sign of her rebellion to come, since she will eventually murder her husband on his return from Troy. But for now, Agamemnon only despairs. He has no choice but to go and prepare the sacrifice to Artemis with the priest Calchas. Then what we've admitted is a fairly lengthy choral chant that anticipates that the Greek army will sail out for Troy and imagines that the soldiers, what the soldiers will, will find there, the walled city and its famous inhabitants, its king Priam um, and his daughter, the prophetess Cassandra, as well as Helen, who the Greeks will attempt to recapture when they sack the city. The song ends on the one hand with a pit of women of Calchas wish that they may never suffer the fate of the Trojan women who are destined to be captured from their homes. And they even adopt uh, very poignantly the voice of the Trojan women and exclaim, what man then tightening his grasp on my luxuriant hair to make me weep shall pluck me from my perished fatherland. And on the other hand, the story of Helen is in some ways uh, at least for genealogy, completely fabricated. And this seems a wonderful Euripidean wink at the play uh, called Helen, which, which you, you actually began this uh, web series, Joel. Uh, after this, the dialogue resumes, and it's time for Agamemnon's plan to completely backfire in his absence. Achilles uh, arrives looking for Agamemnon, his commander, angry at waiting at Naulis by the bay, uh, having no idea that he's about to be married, he ironically who wished to set off and win glory in women, but he's only greeted by Clytemnestra, his aspiring mother-in-law, and a sort of comedy of errors briefly ensues until the misunderstanding is revealed to both of them. Where is Achaea's general? Which of his servants will announce to him that Achilles, the son of Peleus, is at his gates seeking him? But this delay at the Euripus is not the same for all of us. There are some, for instance, who, being still unwed, have left their houses desolate and are idling here upon the beach, while others are married but without children. So strange the longing for this expedition that has fallen on their hearts by the will of the gods. My own just plea, I must declare, and whoever else has any wish will speak for himself. Though I have left Pharsalia and Peleus, still I linger here by reason of these light breezes at the Euripus, restraining my myrmidons while they are always pressing on me, saying, why do we tarry, Achilles? How much longer must we count the days to the start for Ilium? Do something if you are so minded, or lead home your men, and do not wait for the tardy action of these Atridae. Hail to you, son of the Nereid goddess. I heard your voice from within the tent and came forth. Oh, modesty revered, who can this lady be whom I behold so richly dowered with beauty's gifts? No wonder you do not know me, seeing I am one you have never before set eyes on. I praise your reverent address to modesty. Who are you? And why have you come to the mustering of the Danaids? You, a woman, 
to a fenced camp of men. I am the daughter of Leda. My name is Clytemnestra, and my husband, King Agamemnon. Well, and shortly answered on all important points, but it is shameful for me to stand talking to women. Stay. Why seek to escape? Give me your hand, a prelude to a happy marriage. What is it you say? I give you my hand. To lay a finger where I have no right, I could never meet Agamemnon's eye. The best of rights you have. Seeing it is my child you will wed. O oh, son of the sea goddess, daughter of Nereus. What wedding do you speak of? Words fail me, lady. lady. Can your wits have gone astray, and are you inventing this? All men are naturally shy in the presence of new relations. When these remind them of their wedding... Lady, I have never courted your daughter, nor have the sons of Atreus ever mentioned marriage to me. What can it mean? Your turn now to marvel at my words, for yours are very strange to me. Hazard a guess that we can both do in this matter, for it may be we are both correct in our statements. What? Have I suffered such indignity? The marriage I am courting has no reality, it seems. I am ashamed of it. Someone, perhaps, has made a mock of you and me. Pay no heed to it. Make light of it. Farewell. I can no longer face you with unfaltering eyes after being made a liar and suffering undeservedly. It is farewell I bid you too, lady, and I go within the tent to seek your husband. So this drama of half-truth and confusion continues for a little bit as each character on, uh, that we've seen on stage, Clytemnestra and um, Achilles, come clo closer to the full story. Uh, if you didn't catch it, Achilles was wrapped into this whole lie as the bridegroom of Iphigenia in her um, fake wedding for the real sacrifice. Um, and he was never informed about it. So he shows up and, you know, at this point, he's a young man. He's a proud man and somebody's arranging him without telling him. And so this is almost comic break but that prefaces different tensions in the play, again, looking for causes and talking about partial truths and who, know what, who knows what when. The ambassador soon, soon returns and tells Clytemnestra the whole story, not about the wedding, but about the sacrifice to come. And at the, at, it is at this point that Achilles starts to be a little more Iliadic, to stand up and to say, well, I will not let her be sacrificed. And it's unclear from his characterization what his motivation is. He says he will protect her. And he complains, my name is murdering for your husband. The chorus returns after this. Um, we wonder how deeply he cares for, for Iphigenia, but he tells Clytemnestra to go to Agamemnon and tell him not to do it. And that if Agamemnon still persists, then Achilles will come in and stop the whole thing, even if he has to fight everyone. Now, the chorus returns and takes us again to the larger mythical plane. It tells the story of the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, ending with um, interesting comments on the inability of human beings to challenge divine will. Quoting, uh, I quote, seeing that godlessness holds sway and virtue is neglected by men and thrust behind them, lawlessness over law prevailing and mortals no longer making common cause to keep the jealousy of gods from reaching them. The sacrifice needs to happen. But what's strange about this play is whereas in Sophocles, you would actually have the prophet on stage or in Aeschylus, you have the gods on stage saying, you need to do this for us. Here we only have human beings with their at best imperfect knowledge of the total events. And the chorus keeps tracing back myth mythical events to the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, which is a scene where the famous apple to the fairest was cast out that led somehow to the Trojan War. The chorus stops and Agamemnon appears on stage with his wife and daughter. Clytemnestra uh, confronts him with the truth and reminds him that he has actually murdered her child before. Clytemnestra was married to Tantalus Agamemnon murdered him and their young son. Somehow she's still married to him. And then again, Iphigenia speaks and changes the story. If I had the eloquence of Orpheus, my father, 
to move the rocks by chanted spells to follow me or charm by speaking anyone I wished, I would have resorted to it. But as it is, I'll bring my tears. The only art I know for that I might attempt and about your knees as a suppliant, I twine my limbs. These limbs your wife here bore. Do not destroy me before my time for it is sweet to look upon the light and do not force me to visit scenes below. I was the first to call you father. You the first to call me child. I was the first to sit upon your knee and give and take the fond caress. And this was what you would say then. Shall I see you, my child, living a happy, prosperous life in a husband's home one day? in a manner worthy of myself. And I in turn would ask, as I hung about your beard where now I am clinging, what then will I do for you? Shall I be giving you a glad reception in my halls, father, in your old age, repaying all your anxious care in rearing me? I remember all we said. It is you who have forgotten and now would take my life. By Pelops, I entreat you to spare me. By your father, Atreus, and my mother here, who suffers now a second time the pangs she felt before bearing me. What have I to do with the marriage of Paris and Helen? Why is his coming to prove my ruin, father? Look upon me. Bestow one glance, one kiss, that this at least I may carry to my death as a memorial of you that you do not heed my pleading. Feeble ally though you are, brother, to your loved ones, yet add your tears to mine and entreat our father for your sister's life. Even in babies, there is a natural sense of evil. Oh, father, see this speechless supplication made to you. Pity me, have mercy on my tender years. Yes, by your beard. We two fond hearts implore your pity, the one a baby, a full grown maid, the other. By summing all my pleas into one, I will prevail in what I say. To gaze upon the light is man's most cherished gift. That life below is nothingness and whoever longs for death is mad. Better live a life of woe than die a death of glory. Unmute, I think. Thank you. Ah, wretched Helen. Great is the struggle that has come to the sons of Atreus and their children, thanks to you and those marriages of yours. While loving my own children, I yet understand what should move my pity and what should not. I would be a madman otherwise. It is terrible for me to bring myself to this, nor is it less terrible to refuse, daughter, for I must do this. You see the vastness of that naval army and the numbers of bronze-clad warriors from Hellas who can neither make their way to Ilium's towers nor raise the far-famed citadel of Troy unless I offer you, according to the word of Calchas the seer, some Mad desire possesses the army of Hellas to sail at once to the land of the barbarians and put a stop to the rape of wives from Hellas, and they will slay my daughter in Argos as well as you and me if I disregard the goddess's commands. It is not Menelaus who has enslaved me to him, child, nor have I followed his wish. No, it is Hellas for whom I must sacrifice you, whether I will or not. To this necessity I bow my head, for her freedom must be preserved as far as any help of yours, daughter, or mine can go. Or they who are the sons of Hellas must be pillaged of their wives by barbarian robbery. Well, we've just heard a very, an extremely moving uh, entreaty by Iphigenia. Uh, and this is followed by a speech that is very revealing of Agamemnon's psychology. Uh, despite claiming to feel pity, he now seems 
relatively detached and he refuses to be moved by his daughter's pleas. Um, also, while making the come and kill his family if he refuses to offer Iphigenia. The matter also clearly takes a political turn and reframes the issue as Joel has already alluded to in his introduction with Agamemnon claiming to be compelled by the whole of Hellas, the whole of Greece, to make the sacrifice of, the, of his daughter. And this can even be, he claims, perceived as a sacrifice for Greece itself to ensure her freedom from barbarians in the East by this argument, Iphigenia's death becomes uh, a group, is presented as a sort of greater good, a national necessity. This eventual acceptance of her death, which reprises sometimes words for word, uh, her father's arguments. But before this, we hear a song sung by uh, Iphigenia herself, which conveys all of her distress she looks across the sea to Troy and she contrasts her situation with that of Paris, um, who was abandoned by his father Priam and exposed to die as an ill omen, but who later became the cow herd who judged the beauty contest among Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Iphigenia, by contrast, is to be sacrificed by her father and sees no rescue in sight. Iphigenia complains of being abandoned by her mother, of being sacrificed in an unholy manner by an impious man. And she engages even in some counterfactual wishful thinking, never to have seen Helen, never the Greek ships to have been stuck in Aulis in the first place. She concludes with an affirmation of the universality of human suffering. Next scene brings back Achilles who returns with a group of soldiers, the Myrmidons, in order to confront Agamemnon and attempt to rescue Iphigenia. A dialogue between daughter and mother precedes his arrival, as we'll now hear. Oh, mother that bore me, I see a throng of men approaching. It is the goddess's son you see, child, for whom you came here. Open the tent door to me, servants, that I may hide myself. Why seek to escape, my child? I am ashamed to face Achilles. Why? The luckless ending to our marriage causes me to feel abashed. No time for affectation now in face of what has happened. Stay then. Reserve will do no good if we may profit. Daughter of Leda, Lady of Sorrows. No, Miss Noma, that. A fearful cry is heard among the Argives. What is it? Tell me. It concerns your child. An evil omen for your words. They say her sacrifice is necessary. And is there no one to say a word against them? Indeed, I was in some danger myself from the tumult. In danger of what, stranger? Of being stoned. Surely not for trying to save my daughter. For the very reason. Who would have dared to lay a finger on you? All the men of Hellas. Were not your Myrmidon warriors by your side? They were the first who turned against me. My child, we are lost, it seems. They taunted me as the man whom marriage had enslaved. And what did you answer them? Not to kill the one I meant to wed. Justly so. The wife her father promised me. Yes, and sent to fetch from Argos. But I was overcome by clamorous cries. Truly the mob is a dire mischief. But I will help you for all that. Will you really fight them, Silingal Hounded? Do you see these warriors here carrying my arms? Bless you for your kind intent. Well, I shall be blessed. Then my child will not be slaughtered now. Not with my consent at any rate. But will any of them come to lay hands on the maid? Thousands of them, with Odysseus at their head. The son of Sisyphus? The very same. Acting for himself or by the army's order? By their choice and his own. An evil choice indeed, to stain his hands in blood. But I will hold him back. Will he seize and bear her off against her will? Yes, by her golden hair, no doubt. What must I do when it comes to that? Keep hold of your daughter. Be sure that she shall not be slain. As far as that that can help her. Believe me, it will come to this. Mother, hear me while I speak. 
for I see that you are angry with your husband to no purpose. It is hard for us to persist in impossibilities. Our thanks are due to this stranger for his ready help, but you must also see to it that he is not reproached by the army, leaving us no better off and himself involved in trouble. Listen, mother, hear what thoughts have passed across my mind. I am resolved to die, and this I want to do with honour, dismissing from me what is mean. Towards this now, mother, turn your thoughts and with me weigh how well I speak. To me, the whole of mighty Hellas looks. On me, the passage over the sea depends. On me, the sack of Troy, and in my power, it lies to check henceforth barbarian raids on happy Hellas. If ever in the days to come they seek to seize her women, when they have atoned by death for the violation of Helen's marriage by Paris. All this deliverance will my death ensure, and my fame for setting Hellas free will be a happy one. Besides, I have no right at all to cling too fondly to my life, for you did not bear me for myself alone, but as a public blessing to all Hellas. What? Shall countless warriors armed with shields, these myriads sitting at the oar find courage to attack the foe and die for Hellas because their fatherland is wronged and my one life prevent all this. What kind of justice is that? Could I find a word in answer? Now let us turn to that other point. It is not right that this man should enter into battle with all Argos or be slain for a woman's sake. Better a single man should see the light than 10,000 women. If Artemis has decided to take my body, am I a mortal to thwart the goddess? No, that is impossible. I give my body to Hellas, sacrifice it and make an utter end of Troy. This is my enduring monument, marriage, motherhood and fame. All these is it to me. And it is right, mother, that the Hellenes should rule barbarians, but not barbarians Hellenes, those being slaves, while these are free. You play a noble part, maiden, but the whims of fate and the goddess are diseased. Daughter of Agamemnon, some god was bent on blessing me, if I could have won you for my wife. In you I consider Hellas happy, and you in Hellas, for this that you have said is good and worthy of your fatherland. Since you, abandoning a strife with heavenly powers which are too strong for you, have fairly weighed advantages and needs. But now that I have looked into your noble nature, I feel still more a fond desire to win you for my bride. Look to it. For I want to serve you and receive you in my halls. And Thetis be my witness how I grieve to think I shall not save your life by doing battle with the Danaids. Reflect, I say. A dreadful ill is death. This I say without regard to anyone. Enough that the daughter of Tyndareus is causing wars and bloodshed by her beauty. Then be not slain yourself stranger, nor seek to slay another on my account, but let me, if I can, save Hellas. Heroic spirit, I can say no more to this, since you are so minded, for yours is a noble resolve. Why should not one speak the truth? Yet I will speak for you, for you will perhaps change your mind, that you may know when, that you may know then what my offer is. I will go and place these arms of mine near the altar, resolved not to permit your death, but to prevent. For brave as you are at sight of the knife held at your throat, you will soon avail yourself of what I said. So I will not let you perish through any thoughtlessness of yours, but will go to the goddess with these arms and await your arrival there. Mother, why are you so silent? Your eyes wet with tears. I have reason. Woe is me to be sad at heart. Stop. 
Do not make me a coward. Here in one thing, obey me. Tell me, my child, for at my hands you shall never suffer injury. Cut not off the tresses of your hair for me, nor clothe yourself in sable garb. Why, my child? What is it you have said when I have lost you? You will not lose me. I am saved and you renowned as far as I can make you. How so? Must I not mourn your death? By no means, but I shall have no tomb heaped over me. What then? It is death, not the tomb that is rightly mourned. The altar of the goddess, Zeus's daughter will be my tomb. Well, my child, I will let you persuade me, for you speak well. Yes, as one who prospers and does Hellas service. What message shall I carry to your sisters? Do not put mourning raiment on them either. But is there no fond message I can give the maidens from you? Yes, my farewell words and promise me to rear Orestes to manhood. Press him to your bosom. It oh. is your last look. Oh, you that are most dear to me, you have helped your friends as you had means. Is there anything I can do in Argos to please you? Yes. Do not hate my father, your own husband. Fearful are the trials through which he has to go because of you. It was against his will he ruined me for the sake of Hellas. Ah, but he employed base treachery, unworthy of Atreus. Who will escort me from here before my hair is torn? I will go with you. No, not you. That is not well said. Clinging to your robes. Be persuaded by me, mother. Stay here, for this is the better way for both me and you. But let one of these attendants of my father conduct me to the meadow of Artemis, where I shall be sacrificed. Are you gone from me, my child? Yes. And with no chance of ever returning. Leaving your mother? Yes, as you see, undeservedly. Hold! Do not leave me! I cannot let you shed a tear. May it be yours, maidens, to sing hymns in joyous strains to Artemis, the child of Zeus, for my hard lot. And let the order for a solemn hush go forth to the Danaids. Begin the sacrifice with the baskets. Let the fire blaze for the purifying meal of sprinkling. And my father pace from left to right about the altar. For I come to bestow on Hellas safety, crowned with victory. Lead me away. The destroyer of Ilium's town and the Phrygians. Give me wreaths to cast about me. Bring them here, here are my tresses to crown. Bring lustral water too. Dance to Artemis. Queen Artemis, the blessed, around her shrine and altar, for by the blood of my sacrifice, I will blot out the oracle, if it must be. Oh, mother, lady revered, I will not give you my tears, for at the holy rites it is not fitting. Sing with me, maidens. Sing the praises of Artemis, whose temple faces Calchas, where angry spearmen madly, madly chafe, here in the narrow havens of Aulis because of me. O oh, Pelagasia, land of my birth, and Mycenae my home. Is it on Perseus's citadel you call, that town Cyclopean workmen built? To be a light to Hellas did you rear me, so I do not say no to death. You are right. No fear that fame will ever desert you. Hail to you, bright lamp of day and light of Zeus. A different life, a different lot is henceforth mine. Farewell, I bid you, light beloved. Behold the maiden on her way, the destroyer of Ilium's town and the Phrygians, with garlands twined about her head and drops of lustral water on her, soon to be sprinkled with her gushing blood. In that moment, the chorus echoes Iphigenia, and with that language turns her into the hero, or at least the agent who makes the sack of Troy possible, even though it's about to come not for another 10 years. Um, and this 
inversion, this reversal of opinions and plans, um, the third or fourth in the play is followed by yet another surprise. Um, once Iphigenia has signaled her consent to be sacrificed and has echoed this martial language of sacrifice, um, Clytemnestra continues her lament, lays blame first on Paris, then the gods, before turning to the much tortured nature of the human race. Again, constantly moving from the small events they're experiencing to the larger picture of who is actually in control of what's happening. The lament is interrupted by returns on stage and a messenger alights upon the stage who gives an even stranger message. And that's that the sacrifice happened. But right at the end, right at the moment when the girl was about to be killed, nobody saw what happened. They heard the sound and then they looked and there was a doe on the altar. And after this ending, we get a slight moment of reflection um, from a couple of members left on the stage. What joy to hear these tidings from the messenger. He tells you your child is still living among the gods. Which of the gods my child has stolen you? How am I to address you? How can I be sure that this is not an idle tale told to cheer me, to make me cease my piteous lamentation for you? See, King Agamemnon approaches to confirm this story for you. Lady, we may be counted happy as far as concerns our daughter, for in truth she has fellowship with gods. But you must take this tender child and start for home, for the army is looking now to sail. Fare you well. It is long before I shall greet you on my return from Troy. May it be well with you. Son of Atreus, start for Phrygia's land with joy and so return, I pray, after taking from Troy her fairest spoils. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic reading. So in this happier version you've just heard, uh, a miracle happened at the last minute, as, as Joel was saying, whereby Iphigenia was replaced by a doe and therefore saved. But many modern critics actually believe that the play may have ended much more tragically. About a hundred lines earlier with Iphigenia going willingly to her death. In such a version, perhaps nothing was actually said about her having been saved. It's not that Euripides didn't consider such a possibility. In fact, that's the entire premise of his earlier play, Iphigenia and Tauris, um, written sometime in 414, 412 BC, where Iphigenia had been rescued in this matter and transported by Artemis to serve as her priestess in the land of the Taurians. And there, Iphigenia, uh, keeping with the theme of human sacrifice, has the responsibility of slaughtering all the foreigners whose land in the kingdom to the goddess Artemis. Um, so this is a fascinating play in, in many, many ways, not only due to its complexity in terms of textual tradition, uh, its posthumous production, and its uh, staging, as we've heard on some occasions, and we'll have It's a really interesting case study um, since it touches on many issues that we, we wrestle with really when we try to understand uh, this ritual. Uh, what is sacrifice and why do the gods uh, desire it? And this was something that the Greeks themselves problematized. Um, the gods uh, could be angry, vengeful, they could maim, they could kill. Uh, in a common view, the gods had appetites also. They, they were clearly hungry for blood uh, and myth. Um, uh, that at some point in the remote past, human sacrifice to the gods had been a reality. And this play clearly uh, makes that real. Um, one, one myth that belongs uh, to the, the, the genre of uh, 
uh, origins of sacrifice is actually that of Tantalus, uh, the great grandfather of Agamemnon, who held a banquet for the gods at which he served his child Pelops. And most of the gods, of course, realized this and were far from pleased. Tantalus was banished to Tartarus to serve in eternal divine punishment with Pe while Pelops was brought back to life. Uh, and these myths sort of paint a picture of a uh, uh, once shared a table, but the mortals had been banished from it now, and they had to perpetually appease the gods with offerings, uh, eating with them, but at a distance, at a remove. Um, Euripides doesn't really play up this myth of Tantalus as far as I can see, though it must at least lie partly in the background of what is being considered. In fact, there are only a few references in the play to human sacrifice being something that might be called taboo or prohibited, Iphigenia at one point makes this kind of lament, as uh, we've seen, um, calling um, her father an impious sacrificer, offering her in an impious manner. Uh, so perhaps it, in what one might call the more tragic version of the ending, with Iphigenia being led off to her death and her rescue, uh, uh, the rescue idea remaining only a possibility to the audience, um, the implication was that the human sacrifice uh, was an ill-considered attempt to satisfy Artemis, uh, perhaps would do so of the problems of the Atreids eventually have direct re repercussions on Agamemnon and his family. Um, alternatively, if you uh, buy this idea of a, a last minute substitution of a doe for Iphigenia, then the illicit sacrifice was completely averted and Artemis didn't have to be blamed for being thirsty for human blood. Um, and there are many things that we could say uh, also about uh, this type of sacrifice uh, to Artemis. Uh, perhaps we can come back to that uh, in questions. Two, two other One is the pervasive motive motif in Greek tragedy, which is often to referred to as the death of the maiden. This is the widespread idea that marriage for young women was a sort of death, or at least that wedding and funerary rituals could easily become conflated. Uh, in this play, for instance, we hear that Iphigenia is about to become the wife of Hades, uh, to use Agamemnon's words. Um, it's even possible to see the whole play as a sort of wedding celebration with Iphigenia crowned in preparation for the wedding, being sacrificed herself to Artemis as a sort of preliminary offering. So, and Artemis herself is particularly associated with rites of maturation for young women. And there's thus a, a cultic reality which is underlying the whole process. I like that you that you bring in that that bit about being married to Hades for a couple of reasons. There's this yeah. line that that uh, Iphigenia says, which is that I'm going to live another fate, a different life. And there's this ambiguity in ancient Greek, this heteros, right? It can mean just another, or it can mean different. And the way we put it in an English, that connotation um, is important. Um, I, I, you probably know this, Matt, but on ancient funerary inscriptions from an early period, young women who yeah. die before marriage are often said to be brides of Hades. And some of the language there is, is pretty powerful. Um, so I want to sort of use this as a transition to talk about the performance. It's sort of thinking about this one question. Um, and that's like, does the ending matter? Right? Does the life she goes to matter? It's like if she gets to marry Achilles, or sac be sacrificed and die, or whisked away by Artemis, what kind of a different life is it? And the reason I ask is, and this is for sort of Adam and for the actors, bringing tragedy into the modern day. Um, we have to think about sort of Aristotelian comments and ideas about what a tragedy is. And one of the central lines of interpretation that we've had for so long is that a tragedy is a story in which someone starts out in a good position and ends up in a worse one. Right. Um, and when I teach a play like this, I try to get students to think about like, who, who's the tragic figure in this play? 
right? How are we supposed to think of Iphigenia and Agamemnon and even Achilles? And so Adam, you started talking about before about these radical emotional transitions. And mm. I thought the actors did a phenomenal job. Achilles, Agamemnon, Iphigenia, and Clytemnestra was just, I mean, both sweetness and little bit of menace there. Um, Eunice, I'd like to see you do this and the Agamemnon back to back. Um, but so let's, let's go around and ask the director and actors, how do you see this play working? Like how does the end matter in sort of charting out the performance and how do you make those transitions work and felt for the audience? So let's mm. start with that. Well, I mean, I, I, I come at this like I think um, majority of contemporary audiences will come at it without much by way of, of depth of my knowledge of the, of the reference points. Uh, I don't really know the mythology. Um, uh, and sort of and sort of freely admit that approaching it as a director my the the things I respond to in it are are, are the really emotional things and for me the the business of, of, of hearing or watching this play is watching two parents lose a child um and 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 that to me is one of the most wrenching uh things you can think about um and so uh the, the 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 tragic side of it for me is to do with is to do with the idea of death and um, there's something that I pick up in the play which is uh, I think the chorus says um, which uh, is um, to do with um, the whims of fate and the goddesses are diseased it's this this sense and the chorus I think to, in this play seems partly to almost speak for the ordinary person in some ways they're aligned a bit with the audience they seem to see the play uh, like like, uh, like like mere mortals and not like great mythic creatures. And I think there's various lines in the play that refer to that. And this sense that the universe is kind of random and cruel, that fate can just intervene and destroy something. And you could take a sort of step back from the, the I guess the geopolitics of the play and just see this as a play where two parents through the horrors of fate have to, lo have to, have to lose their own child and, and watching them go through that. and. To me, that is just so arresting. Uh, I mean, maybe partly as someone who has recently become a parent and thinking about not even the death of a child, but about the business of being a parent, being partly about having to accept that in stages you let your child go. Um, and as your child grows up, you start to let them go just because you let them take risks and you, you let them go out on their own and you let them become come more and more face to face with the possibility of their own. Uh, mortality and like I, I I feel that that is just so overarchingly human and kind of to me uh kind of so it comes away from the kind of the the mythic context of the play um certainly uh, that's that's what's drawn me to it as a director it's why it's always sort of been in my mind as as if, if someone said to me stage a Greek tragedy this is probably top of my list um, and certainly in terms of the approach I'd take, the, the center of the thing would be trying to, to, trying to build that sense of a family um, in the rehearsal room and, you know, um, among the actors, build that sense of the kind of the truth of it and the depth of the feeling between, you know, when amazingly uh, Clytemnestra says, you know, you're, you're his favorite daughter and feeling that that is real and truthful to the actors. To me, that is, that's kind of uh, sort of the way in. Um, so I I love what you mentioned there about fate and sort of choice. And I think we can then move to the actors because one of the central challenges for each of these characters, it seems, is figuring out how much your will and choice actually matters, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Agamemnon, Michael, I think for you as a character, um, you're constantly changing your mind, right? And it seems like at the end, all of these machinations are to nothing. Like, how, how, how did you see that when you read the lines and navigate that in your readings? Uh, I think um, one of the things that, that for me is interesting coming to it as a, a, um, with a modern take, with a modern, with a mo as a modern viewer, if you like, and not knowing the play at all uh, is, is, the, is the humanity of it. And as Adam said, the the extraordinary uh, emotional scenes between the, the family members, which are sort of juxtaposed with these, uh, I suppose what I thought would be more dominant in Greek tragedy, which is 
um, geopolitics and ideology and the gods and this wonderful combat between duty uh, and love and absolute um which we recognize so so strongly it doesn't matter it doesn't matter when it was written when it was performed um so i think those conflicts are very central to anything i, I mean i said when you asked me at the beginning about um uh the scene with menelaus that, that, that it's the, the the conflict between the two brothers leads to more profound thoughts that come out in some of Agamemnon's early longer speeches. And I think um, in the same way, for me, what is most interesting in this is the, the way that almost there, there, are, there are the characters uh, with whom they're relating in, in an absolutely naturalistic and way we recognize totally, but there are other characters, i.e. Um, uh, the necessity to sacrifice the, the 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 order that is handed down is almost like another character that that has its input um then at the end the, the hellas you know hellas becomes almost a character uh and it's hellas who wins the battle in agamemnon's mind it's it, it, he has to do it for for hellas so I mean, I, I, there's all, what I love about tragedy that we often miss in modern performances is that weight of what exists outside the stage and off the play. I think Eunice um, taking on the character of Clytemnestra, when you're reading the words and inhabiting her, um, did you feel the pressure of the other Clytemnestras of the weight of what she is famous for? Or were you just following what the words that Euripides gave? Um, I, I was following these words because sad, sadly I don't know enough or, or much at all about the others. My goodness me, would I like to get my head into this world and these worlds because they're just so fascinating. So if, if, you, if you've got a sort of ABC of this, then I shall read it. Um, but it, but it is, and it sort of echoes really what, what Michael was saying in that you know, there is a sense of duty, and so she's coming and she's going to do things properly. You know, she knows how to do these things. <laughs> you know, nobody can teach her better than how to do these things. You know, coming up the chariot and all of that and meeting husband and yes, I know, you know, you're, he's your favourite and all of that. And then just this human aspect comes into it of I will go along with the rule book so, because that's what I always feel, that there's a, a bigger world telling these people how to behave. But where any human action or drama or tragedy comes into it is where they make the choice not to follow the outside world, the world of the gods. And it's that clash where then sparks fly and, and then it becomes a human story as opposed to just a story that you could hear from the gods. Yeah, I think what, what's remarkable about, again, the weight of the choice that individuals have in the face of tradition and external circumstances is that that weight seems to be taken away only for a single character. And that's when I think we can talk to you, Evie. Um, I just want to say about you that some transitions you had there, just wow. I mean, Iphigenia, like, this is a hard movement to make from moment to moment. Um, can you talk about what you were thinking when you were going through the choice to, 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 cons to give your consent to sacrifice? I think there's, um, there's something really interesting um, as, uh, for the audience, but also, you know, reading it. There's something really interesting about reading a text that's this old when a character's decision to do something that seems, you know, Ter completely terrifying. So much of what she talks about is her fame, the, the legend of her name, how she will endure, how she will become a character who lives and is lauded. And reading, reading those words thousands of years on is incredible because I feel like we, in doing this, in reading this play that's called Iphigenia, 
it's a kind of celebration of the fact that although in the moment the character is not convinced that that will happen, um, the fact that we're here and, and reading this together confirms that the decisions that that she that she makes do confirm her fame and and there's an interesting play I suppose with um, you know this discussion of life is life to be remembered is life to be here on earth in in this light that she talks about is there an immortality to be had in the preservation of your memory um, through different cultures and you know now on Zoom <laughs> I think. There's this really interesting play, you know, not only with this, the inevitability of this kind of rolling ball of the house of Atreus that we kind of see through from the references to Tantalus and the ancestors, and then you've got baby Orestes and, you know, there's this, the kind of rolling of time that's happening within the characters' lives and, you know, the kind of generations that surround them, but then also us thousands of years in the future. Um, and I think that that definitely helps in terms of um, that surety, that um, that that feeling of. I mean, it's amazing the, the the you know the community feeling that she has that her life is less than the the culture she represents, than the country, than the people. Um, it's incredible. I wonder, I wonder with that. So, so, you know, the language is really the similar language and thematically similar to the language of martial war, right? Uh, of saying, you know, lay down your life for the good of the state. Yeah. Um, and here it's being put, you know, in the hands and the, you know, the arms of, um, of a young woman. Right? Mm. And so, I, and I also wonder what it means that, you know, she makes a sacrifice, but then she gets re replaced, right? I mean, do, how does that affect the ending? Um, Tamika, I think that you had probably one of the hardest jobs, um, which is that the chorus, you know, in the ancient world, it could have been 50 to 100 people. And the mm -hmm. position they occupy in the story is strange. Um, did you feel you were a different voice every time? Or how did you feel that your presence impacted the narrative? Well, I, I agree with what Adam said about how the chorus seemed to be the um, the emotion, the presence of everyone else, mm -hmm. aside from the the main characters, um, you know, the the audience, the bystanders that um, that have an opinion or have a um, a, uh, a reaction to what's going on, and normally as an audience member it's just to the person to your left or the person to your right or a bystander who happens to be witnessing everything they're just talking to their immediate people around them and here you have them actually interjecting their what they think of everything and 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 also it, it feels like it's um pushing the the story along so yes, I, it felt like, I felt like I was everyone, everyone else just commenting and, and sharing my own, our own um, interjections of what was happening. I like that you, you have become a medium in a medium. Yeah. Uh, so before we, we close today, we've been we've been talking a lot about sort of the dramaturgy of our disembodied world. And I'd like to start maybe again with Adam and Matt, since I haven't done this um, before. But, you know, ancient tragedy was about spectacle. It was about enjoying things in communities of the thousands. Um, how does this frame create an intimacy and engagement with the narratives um, that presents new possibilities? So maybe Adam and then Matt. You mean the very the very frame of Zoom, or something similar? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, outside of Zoom, first, I mean, my, I, you know, partly that you know, staging things on the scale that uh, we just talked about with you know, many many people as the chorus is is actually a very complicated thing to do. Very few theatres can even afford to do that if we're talking about just the economics of theatre production, and it's just not necessarily where we're at. Um, uh, as a sort of theatre making culture, and in, in many ways, my response to it is. It is to want it to be as intimate and close up as possible. 
and and funnily enough, that that does actually Zoom theatre is something that has sprung up in some ways in the last few weeks out of necessity. Um, and uh, I've just found myself uh, doing um, not the whole of, but extracts of um, uh, Cymbeline by William Shakespeare over Zoom because uh, for um, for a drama school, in fact, for the uh, British American Drama Academy of which of which Eunice, who read Clytemnestra, is the dean. Um, uh, and uh, um, this was because we were, you know, on the day we were due to start was the day that, uh, that, that every, every student had to fly, in, in this case, back from London to America. And um, I, I was sort of pleasantly surprised by what was possible um, in that format, um, partly because uh, I think that the thing about doing something on, say, Zoom is you, it, it is actually still a live event and there is still actors acting in real time in front of an audience but because also I think the the intimacy that's possible with with being able to get um, very close to a webcam um, but still uh, be able to see other people and converse is opening up I mean it's so new mm. I can barely really speak for it as a form but I have a strange feeling it may stay and outlast the uh, the days of lockdown um, and uh, evolve um, and it certainly opens up the possibilities of, of kind of international collaborations um, in a kind of virtual, a sort of virtual space, basically. It's sort of a, a, bizarre, a bizarre theatrical TikTok, right, where you can integrate a bunch together. Uh, Matt, um, you haven't, the, you, you know, you're an expert in ancient theater. Um, how did this experience, all. <laughs> well, I mean, more than, yeah, but how does this experience change your view of what theater does? Completely, and and I found it extremely. Experiment, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, I, I I'm I'm a sort of a bookish person. I, I tend to study texts and inscriptions and things like that. And just to be part of this uh, narrative with you, all of you, it was it was absolutely uh, transformative uh, to, to to be able to sort of uh, connect the pieces, as it were, by providing some some links between the, the scenes and, and just to be, uh, as you were saying, um, uh, Adam, with the, the, the intimacy, uh, the intimacy of the, of the format as well, the, the fact that we're all uh, wearing our headphones and kind of uh, he hearing the conversations as they're happening uh, uh, live like this. And it, it feels like you're something that's both personal as well as shared with uh, uh, a wider community. So it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, Tim, you uh, are a veteran of this process now. Um, how is reflecting on the experience and thinking about sort of, you know, the intellectual bookish experience of Matt um, or other viewers experience, how has it changed the way you prepare for these sessions or has it not? No, uh, I am probably just going to sound like a bit of a broken record, really. I, I, I absolutely adore these, these Wednesday evenings. And just this discovery of these plays is just uh, incredible, really. And I think they, and the reason I sound like a broken record is because I think I've said it in every previous discussion, just the, the, the relevance that they have to what we're going through today. I think what the, the experience that we are all in, in lockdown and, and, the, and the health crisis that is going on around the world is just so extraordinary. And I think these plays just tap into that. And as, as, well, as, as well as that sort of universal uh, element to it and, I, I think they talk to us in this sort of personal way. And it's, it's what everybody's been saying, really. Just, just the fact that they so cleverly encapsulate these personal fam family dramas at the same time as dealing with the gods and plagues and life and death. It's just, it just feels suddenly very, very relevant in a way that I've never sort of considered Greek tragedy and Greek drama to be before. So I, I, for me, it's just a beautiful discovery of these, of these brilliant, brilliant plays. And I just, I just love it. I, I'm there with you. I, I haven't read them all, um, <laughs> even though it's been, I have lots, lots of opportunity to. Uh, Paul, to, to sort of close with you, um, 
you've been we've now been talking about this for several weeks. Um, you spent a little more time thinking about the text that we're working on. Um, how did you approach it differently this time, or what have you learned from this play that you didn't know before? Well, I tell you what was was really interesting from this experience, um, and it's something, and it's just something about. Um, it can happen with every text, to be honest, but there's something about when you gather people together and then you hear a text aloud, how different it is to just you know, reading it uh, uh, in your own head, basically. And what really kind of came through to me um, just this evening, actually, as we were, as we were doing it, was just um, how much a sort of less impressive these grand characters are then you kind of might expect them to be sort of you kind of go oh Agamemnon you know uh, you know Lord of Men he's going to be absolutely fantastic Menelaus you know he's going to just absolutely brought they're going to be brilliant and actually there's this and you sort of touched on it earlier there's it kind of feels like this that there's a kind of power vacuum right at the top and we put our trust in these people at the top to kind of make good decisions and then actually you find that they're just sort of making it up as they go along they're as confused as we are um, and that's sort of quite disturbing to find that. and that kind of just came through more and more you know then you kind of go oh Achilles will sort of really take control and then actually you find well no I'm not sure Achilles is going to really get a grip on this either <laughs> and then you go so who's going to save us in this whole scenario oh Iphigenia is going to solve it and it takes Iphigenia solving it and giving her life to actually for there to be any kind of resolution kind of within this and that it, it was really interesting how that came through um so much more sort of when we were all kind of gathered together reading it. I like, I, I like the way that you, each of you are mentioning sort of the, the sense of crisis and the sense of all of us being in it together. You know, many of the plays we have come from Athens at a time of empire when they're almost always in perpetual crisis. And one of their favorite metaphors um, was the ship of state, right? And there, there is you know, a proverb, uh, common ship, ship, common safety. Um, and you're right, Paul, you get in a storm and some of us are at the oars, some of us are at the rigging and you're looking around like, well, who's steering this thing? But what I do like, again, is that you mentioned the importance of community in reading the, these plays and bringing them to life and sharing them together. And each week we bring, you know, the actors bring something to it and they bring it alive in an important way, as Evie said, right? We are recreating the, this fame um, and recreating the stories. And I think, again, before closing, I'd be remiss not to mention the people who keep our ship afloat. Um, so we're helped each week by Sarah, by Lana, by Janet, um, by Keith and Greg, who's sponsoring this, and Ellen. Um, and thank you all for being here right, and, and keeping us going. Um, and hopefully we can keep this ship afloat for, uh, I don't know, what, 35 more weeks? Is that what we're looking for? A little more? All right. Um, so I think we're at the end of our time tonight. Um, next week, we'll be reading Sophocles' Trachinian Women, and our special guest will be Amy Pistone from Gonzaga. Um, until then, everybody stay safe and stay well um, and read some Greek plays. Take care.